The Island by Chris Hart. The Nessians prefer the sound of a breath-driven instrument, and they called to the sea as my darling was laid to her rest that late summer day in the place I thought of as the end of the world. First trumpets as we took her small body to the place, and then the nose flute crying into the ocean. I kissed a coffin there on the hill as the sea crashed below. Such a small casket for so many hopes. It is over now. She is gone. So much is gone. My love for her, the future, and worst of all, my responsibility. I have failed her. She is dead. I walked down the hill before the final farewell was called and took a carriage back to town. Next day, I woke early. My partner, Tama, was not back. He was staying with family for Josephine's farewell. It felt good to be alone, good that I did not have to listen to the messages of sorrow. I went to the refectory for breakfast. The room was almost empty. I ate a small breakfast with coffee. Marie, the Chancellor of the Institute was at a table close by. She was with Cass, Maitland and the others when they rediscovered the White City. She is an expert on elements and built the Arnold Automaton. As I left, she called me over and asked me to sit. Reluctantly, I did so and fixed my expression ready for the sympathy. She looked at me. You put in a plan to go to Ohupuku Island for the transit of Afrod. Do you still want to go? I looked at her, and the last few months I'd not thought much about it. I assumed I would be doing other things. The original idea was to go to the island and take sightings of the planet as it passed in front of the sun. A number of other institutes and sect houses were doing the same in various parts of the world. A sighting from an island so far south would be useful. Yes, I said. Yes, I'd like to go. We can't put too much effort into this. You know an airship goes down there twice a year to check for castaways and reprovision the emergency supplies. The autumn one goes in three weeks. You would have to gather supplies and plan to leave by that date. The ship will come and pick you up six months later. The conditions on the island are harsh at best. There's a good chance you may not make it alive through the winter. You could take the icon. Is it Nartus? With you, but that is all. She looked at me. If you can give me an answer by the end of today, we might just make it. I left her and went back to my room. So much planning in such a short time. Once word of the expedition got out, I was deluged with suggestions and plans for tests. The island was isolated and deep in the southern ocean. Every expert from bird to fish to sea mammal to plants wanted to get some kind of tests done in this unique environment. And that did not include tracking the transit of Afrod. For that we needed precise machinery, calibrated and mounted, to take advantage of the four or five hour window of the transit. Kess herself brought the master chronometer from Singapore for the observation. On the day I left I was feeling anxious. The frenetic activity to get ready had occupied me so much the pain of my loss was a little dull. That morning when I woke, it all came back and I dragged myself out of bed, ready for the trip. I wept a few tears as I left Tama. I could tell he was sad, but he was being strong. We landed at the end of the harbour, close beside the cliffs. The beach was covered in driftwood. A natural track led from the beach up to the bluffs. The captain tried to point out the caves and the cliff face, but I could not see them. It was raining, not a hard rain, 
but a gentle persistent rain that said, I've been doing this for days and I can go on for as long as I feel like. Nartus, the captain and I, walked around the edge of the beach and up a long meadow below the cliffs. I could see the cave entrances now. They were about 50 metres along the cliff, dark holes against the lighter rock. We walked up and into one of the openings. It was hardly home, but I could see how we could make a door, close off a cave and create a secure living space. Inside was about 8 metres high and 10 metres wide. It extended quite far back. There would be room for a test area and living areas. Not exactly the Savoy, the captain said, but it was a most complete world and what I needed, isolated and to some extent controlled. I looked down on the place, the landscape I would be part of, hard, cold and unforgiving, and I took it to my heart. Here I would make my life. I would be real. We walked back down to the shore and started the process of moving supplies. Two days later it was done. The cave entrance was closed off, the floor was covered in matting, pack lights and heating were installed and enough supplies to last the winter and beyond. The air crew had managed to install a fireplace with a chimney poking out the front of the cave. On that final night we all gathered together. Officers sitting at the table in the cave, crew serving and also taking advantage of the casks of wine and beer stored in the corners. It was a merry time. The crew had worked hard and this was their night for celebration. The cook had surpassed herself and we had a meal that went from soup to fish to meat to a large boiled pudding. Each course was matched to different wine and by the time we got to the port, everyone was in fine form. We finished with an hour of singing, crew and officers. We sang favourite and sentimental songs. In truth, it was more pirate than navy, but the old habits from the naval service came to the fore, and by ten that night, it was just me, the captain and Nartus, seated by the new fire. The flames were shot with colour as the driftwood burned. It was hardwood, too hard to cut with a saw, but there was plenty of it washed on shore from distant parts. From what I could see, the island did not have any trees. The wood had come from far across the ocean. I could hear the wind outside rising and falling with the occasional sound of rain, or maybe sleet, like a handful of gravel thrown against the cover across the cave opening. Pack lights shone on the cave walls, making small shadows of the creases in the rock. Pack powered heating made the whole space warm. I looked to the wall where the crew had made a bed for me, cut from the rock wall. I overheard the crew talking about knights and ladies lying at rest in cold chapels, but the bed was made soft by coverings and bright with coloured blankets. It looked almost eastern. Various tables and store areas made up the back part of the cave, tables already partly laid out with pieces of telescope and boxes of glass bottles. Natus and I would be busy putting all this in order. The number of tests and observations we had to do made a long list. We would be busy. I talked to the captain for a while, mostly about timings and final checks of equipment and survival, what to do if we were reduced to nothing. A quick death for me would be the result, but I did not say that. The captain took his leave. I came out the door at the front of the cave. The wind whipped at me and the rain blew horizontal across the bay. It was going to be a challenge and it was cold. He waved his goodbyes and I watched as his light moved down the meadow toward the shore. He would send someone in the morning before they left, but this would be the last I would see of him until we were picked up months later in what passed for springtime. I went back inside. The light and heat made the cave seem cosy. I went to bed and was asleep within minutes. And I dreamed. It was true, this was the time, and I was there. I opened the big doors at the front of the cave and started my day. I struggled. I walked into the sea. The water washed over me. 
I swam into the stream off the edge of land, into the ocean swell. It heaved me into the air, like a piece of the driftwood that took that place, that took that track. The water was so cold, so clean and so pure, like a release. I relaxed and sank beneath the waves, and so I died there, washed in the ocean, not far from the shore, not far from land, still a thing, still a unit. Natus took my body to the place and covered me with rocks and put me to sleep in the ground and I want you to know that I love you all and I am at peace. There is no blame or judgment. I woke suddenly from that dream. I took a gasp of air almost like the water in my lungs was real. Natus came over. He looked at me. Would you like tea? It is four in the morning, still some hours before dawn. I nodded and looked around. The cave was strange. So dark in the corners and ceiling, the fire still had some embers. I got up, stirred them and added some wood. Soon the multicoloured flames burned. Natus brought me tea and I sat and watched the fire. I dreamed that I swam into the bay and drowned myself and that you'd buried me under the rocks above the cliffs. I looked at him. He was watching me. Would you stop me if I tried to do that? He paused. He looked almost sheepish. Did they warn you I might do something like that? Did they give you instructions? I would not stop you if you tried to do that. I smiled at him. Maybe this will work. The pain is still there, but so is the certainty that I do not want this to end. That is new. I drank my tea and went back to bed. This time I did not dream, and Natus woke me to the dawn's light. He had already folded back the large doors at the front of the cave. The day was blue and bright, but a cold wind poured into the cave. I shivered in my bed, then threw the covers off. I hope it's not too cold, Nata said. It's perfect, and the light is beautiful. He had coffee ready, almost the last of the fresh milk. I walked beside the cliffs towards the airship rather than wait for someone from the crew. The area was quiet. A few of the crew were manning ropes, and a small knot of people stood near the ramp at the rear of the craft. As I approached, I saw the captain and other officers. He waved. Bit of a wind, but at least we have good weather, he smiled. I watched them do their last checks. The captain wished me well. The crew gave me a hat. And then, suddenly the ship was away, climbing into the sky, turning to the north and powering out over the sea. I watched for a while as they got smaller, then turned and walked back to the cave. Natus laid out dry clothes for me and lit a fire. The aircrew had cut a bath out of the rock close to the entrance. At the time, I thought it was a joke, but now I asked Natus to fill it and I would try a bath. A few minutes later, I was immersed in hot water glass of wine perched on the side of the rock bath. What a wonder! I kept the pack heater in the water until the steam rose around me like a hot fog. I slept well that night, but woke feeling drained and depressed. Too much wine. Since Josephine died, more than two glasses of wine made me sad the next day. Suddenly, it all seemed bad. Thoughts kept pushing to my head, and I felt the happy mood from the day before was gone. I went outside, and the weather matched my mood, cold and windy, with small flecks of sleet rushing by. I walked down to where the seals lay on the beach. Most of them were gone, but there was one pair I recognised. The pup was small, born late. I sat on a rock and watched the small body as she lay on the shore. 
I saw the mother come back to her pup. It was late in the season, too late to make it right. Not much movement, not much hope. I went back to the cave and forced myself to work cataloguing and labelling the items we collected the day before. Next morning I went down and saw the mother seal as she sniffed at the dead body. She looked to the sea, the rolling ocean, the future, the hope of life. The time was shifting. She took one more look, a long consideration, and then she was gone into the sea, gone to start again, urgency and judgment, action and statement. I went back to the cave and took a blanket and walked down to the rocks where the still body of her hope lay dead. I rolled her into the cover and dragged her up above the cliff and I covered her child with rocks. And I called her Sissy, like the ancient Sisyphus, the endless process of start and hope and start again. A small baby, a small seal soul, taken back and born again. As that day went by, I began to feel better. The thought of that small seal lying almost on the same spot where I dreamed Natas had laid my body seemed like a release, like a payment. It was almost as if she had died so I could live. I felt I owed her for my hope. Irrational thought, superstition, but it felt right. I grabbed it with both hands and took that thought into my life. From that point the weather became worse and my mood became better. <laughs>